Hello. Um, okay, so as I said, I'm the technical lead on the Fast C Python team. Uh, the Fast C Python project started just over a year ago. Uh, we made some small changes in 3.10, and we've already started making changes in 3.12. Uh, so, but this talk is really focused on what the changes we've made in 3.11. Uh, it's possible that some of the things I say aren't 100% true for 3.11. There may be elements of the others, but, but it's more of a case of giving you a feel for the sort of changes we've made and how it all fits together. So, C Python is a computer program, like many others. Uh, it's written in C, hence the name. Uh, and it runs on a computer. So in order to make it faster, it helps to understand, first of all, how the computer it runs on works. Uh, some understanding of the hardware is helpful. We don't need to be able to build the machine or maintain it, but we need some sort of feeling for its performance characteristics and how they work. Now, modern so CPUs are complicated things. This is an architecture diagram. It was a slightly out-of-date machine. Um, but I want to bring your attention to a couple of things. First of all, it's multiple core, but that doesn't really interest us because of the infamous gill. But even if there wasn't a gill, uh, we'd expect each core to be running a separate thread. So all these uh, the optimizations we're going to talk about would only really apply to one thread anyway. But what is interesting is that within each core, there is parallelism. Uh, every time an instruction is fetched, it's Several instructions usually fetched at one time, and then multiple instructions are dispatched. There's multiple execution units in each core, allowing you to do several introduce operations or several floating point operations or several memory accesses uh, concurrently. Um, and that's kind of the interesting thing about these CPUs. They're called superscalar for, for this reason. Um, the other thing that's important is memory access is important, now, is slow. Now, if we go back to the previous thing, there's no real memory on here, but you'll see elements of caches, and those caches are there to speed up memory access. Um, it takes a long time for light to move around if you're clocking at five gigahertz. In five gigahertz, light moves six centimeters. It's not very far, and electrons move considerably slower than that. So it takes physically, it's just impossible to make memory access fast. Uh, it's just a physical limitation. So the way we work around, the CPUs work around it is they have layers of cache. They have a tiny L1 cache, and I mean tiny, as in a few kilobytes. Uh, and that's only a four cycles delay. Then there's a L2 cache, which is typically 10 cycles. Uh, L3 cache, which is larger still and shared across the cores, and that's usually used for sort of intercore communication. Uh, that's 30 cycles, and then RAM is a couple of hundred cycles. These superscalar CPUs can work around the delays, and they can push forward some execution while others are delayed. But as a first sort of general principle, we want to avoid memory accesses. Um, the exact details are very hard to work out. Trying to get precise timings is extremely hard on modern ha hardware. But just bear in mind a simple thing, that if you have uh, a memory access, it's generally going to be slow. And because, as I said, the superscalar, it's dependent memory accesses are the thing we really want to avoid. So if we have two memory accesses, and we can do both at the same time because they're independent, the CPU can largely do them at the same time. If we have a memory access that depends on another memory access, in other words, we need the data from the first one to work out where the, to look in the memory for the second one, that's going to be doubly slow. OK. Now, back in 1976, uh, Nicholas Wirt was a famous computer scientist, and he wrote this uh, textbook. It's called Algorithm Plus Data Structures Equals Programs, which is a large, right, slightly fuzzy picture. I've got a Amazon there. Um, now, I just want to sort of split this thing into two. So there are basically before object-oriented programs, which kind of merge the whole concept of data structures and algorithms. This was a kind of important way of looking at programs, and it still applies to sort of low-level system stuff like CPython or Linux or Windows or other things like that. Um, so we're going to sort of split this talk into two, the sort of data structures part and algorithms. So first of all, we're going to look at the data structures. So we're going to look at some data structures in CPython and how we've changed them in 3.11 for better performance. Right, but before we get into real data structures, just a little quick uh, sort of aside, just to sort of give you a feel for this sort of thing. 
So uh, a linked list is a data structure you might be familiar with from your computer classes or from bad job interviews where they ask you to implement a linked list. And as you can see from the, the image, uh, and comparing with an array list, it's quite an inefficient structure. It's inefficient in a couple of ways. So suppose we want to access the integer two at the second uh, in index two in the, in the list. In the array list on the left, is on the left, isn't it? Yes. The array list on the left, we need to follow four links. And because we're following a link, we need to read the memory uh, in the head to point to the link. And once we've read that, we know where the link is, and then we can read the memory in that. So this is four dependent memory loads to get to two. If we look at the array list on the right, it's only the two loads. Still dependent, but it's only two. And not only that, every time we want to add an element to the list, we need to allocate more memory. Now, allocating memory is another slow operation. I mean, not for physical reasons, just because there's lots of code involved. Um, so, yeah, so just sort of designing the data structures to avoid these dependent loads and excessive memory allocations is kind of important. Uh, but before we look at the implementation of any data structures, I just want to give you a quick refresher on uh, frame stacks and frames in Python. Whenever you call a Python function, we need somewhere to put the values in the local variables, any temporary variables, the, the reference to the module globals, and a few other bits and pieces. And these go in a frame object. Uh, this frame contains, well, I've said, no, said what it contains. Uh, and so. Every time you call a Python function, we, take, we create a new frame object, and then it calls other Python functions that push frame objects and so on. And so we form a stack of frame objects. Now, note I use the term stack here, because in Python 3.10 and earlier, we have this, which is awfully like the linked list example I gave you before. Now, this isn't as bad as the linked list, because we only ever really want to access the top frame that we're currently executing. So we don't have to worry about the sort of extra cost of following the links. But we do need to worry about the memory allocation. We're allocating memory each time. Now, in Python 3.10 earlier, there was some sort of caching involved. But conceptually, we still have to do this allocation. And even with the caching, it's not as efficient as it could be. Now, the point is, this is a stack. So we implement it as a stack in 3.10. So in 3.10, we just allocate a big chunk of memory per thread. It's actually sort of several linked chunks because we don't know in advance how big the stack's going to get. But in almost all cases, we can just uh, allocate a, fret, a new frame by just reusing the memory in that chunk. Now, this has a number of advantages, and we still need the sort of link pointer to follow, which I'll come to in why we need that in a minute. Um, but it's still much faster than... Uh, having to chase around memory, just because we can compute the offsets from one to the other. But also, what I was saying earlier about caches. The thing with a stack is that the bit you're just using is probably the bit you've just used for a previous function. So it's still in the cache, almost certainly. Which means, as opposed to a new frame, which might be anywhere in memory and may not be in the cache, so the cache performance of this is about as good as you can get. And we're not having to do a new allocation for each time we call a Python function. But you may be wondering, doesn't this change the Python semantics? I don't know if you, some of you will have used sys.getframe. Um, unfortunately, we all have encountered exceptions. Uh, and exceptions count with a traceback, and that traceback includes frame objects. So how do we do with this? So what we do in this case is we, when we need to, we allocate a frame object. So, you can imagine that I've only just shown the frame object for the, the, the frame on the top of the stack, but you can imagine ones for each, in, uh, each frame. You can imagine that we'd allocate a frame object for each one, the one in yellow and the lower one in white. And we would link those as if they were the previous ones. So effectively, we could sort of lazily recreate this sort of stack if we need to. So basically, this is a general principle of sort of optimization we do. We, we, Design it so that the special, the usual case, the common case is fast, and make sure that we can continue to uh, perform correctly for the less common case, even though the less common case might end up being slightly slower than it was in earlier versions. So typically, normal execution becomes faster, and raising an exception becomes a tiny bit slower. Unless your code is 
odd, shall we say. You would expect that reception should be relatively rare. Um, I mean, we give an example earlier of you sort of look before you leap thing, where exceptions have become a little more common. But generally, you know, they're still the rare case, and those pieces of code are tip not typical code anyway. You will have some of them in your code base, but in terms of sort of execution counts, they're rare. One other thing you may have noticed in this is it looks like I might be cheating by dropping a few things here to make it look smaller. But one of those is, so there's a debug information in there, which we lazily allocate in the frame object here. And the other is the exception stack. Now, the exception stack we've dropped in 3.11 because we have what's called zero-cost exceptions. Zero-cost exceptions is their technical name. Obviously, they're not really zero-cost because nothing is, but they're pretty close. The way exceptions worked in 3.10 is that if you had a try accept statement, the, the, uh, what would happen is when you hit the try statement, the try, we would push a little uh, piece of data onto a stack, internal stack, which told us where to go and uh, how much stuff to pop off the execution stack if there were an exception. And then we got to the end of the try body, that would be popped off. That works perfectly. But it means every time you enter a try and leave a try, you're doing a little bit of work. And we need somewhere to put that stuff as well, those things. So that took up 160 bytes, I think, in 310. And earlier, it was 240 bytes in each frame, uh, which is somewhat wasteful given. And that's because we have a maximum exception depth of 20. Uh, if you try and write tw try accepts nested 21 deep in Python, you'll get a syntax error. You've probably never done that. And I wouldn't recommend you do. Uh, OK, so the way it works in 3.11 is that instead of pushing these blocks, what we do is in the, the bytecode compiler, we analyze where the exception would jump to for each bytecode. And then we just create tables that describe that. And those tables are stored alongside the normal code. Um, that's a little bit slower, again, when an exception is raised. But it has no real cost when we don't raise an exception. There is a tiny cost, obviously, because it, it uses a little bit more memory in the code object. But so zero cost exceptions, you probably consider as mostly zero cost exceptions. OK, so that's frame objects. Now let's discuss the more sort of normal objects. So plain old Python objects. So here's a plain old Python object. It doesn't do anything. Just takes two attributes and assigns them to itself. Um, this, obviously, most Python objects look kind of like this, but with obviously some extra code to actually do something. Um, so this is a kind of standard Python object. So let's look at how this is laid out in memory. Now, Python objects, I know you may have heard this probably, you can consider Python objects as just a sort of a thin wrap around a dictionary. Essentially, they give you that sort of nice syntactic sugar where you can do, instead of like ex, uh, looking up the item in the dictionary by its sort of quoted name, you just do a dot name attribute lookup. Um, that's sort of one way of looking at it. I mean, we don't really necessarily think of them in that way. But every object has this dunder dict attribute, which will allow you to get to this in dictionary. But almost all code never, doesn't actually access the dictionary directly. It's very rarely used. Um, another thing we need to consider about Python objects is that they are not fixed size. Now, what I mean by that is not that they can have a variable number of attributes, because as you just said, they kind of belong in the dictionary. But it can also have other things that sort of change the size of the, the Python object. This will become relevant in a second when I show you the diagrams. Uh, objects can, could um, inherit from built-in things like an integer, or you can have done slots, which change the layout of the object. Uh, so that's a little tricky. So a naive implementation of this can be rather slow and bulky. So here's the naive implementation. We haven't had a naive implementation since Python 3.2. But I'm going to show you anyway, because I think it's illustrative of the sort of overheads and the sort of, the, the sort of logical, simple way of, of, of um, implementing this. So you have an object, and it has a pointer to its class and its dictionary, basically. Except that because it's variable size, the pointer to the dictionary isn't at a fixed offset, so we need to look up what the offset is in the class. Now, the color, the light green color, basically is because that's our shared instances. In other words, there's one of those per class. So if you have a thousand instances of a class, or a million, 
uh, there's only one of those. So that's in green because their memory cost is effectively amortized, but per additional object is, is zero. The red ones, however, are redundant information per instance. In other words, there's stuff we really don't need but we want to get rid of. So basically, you've got your object, it's got its class, it's got a, um, a dictionary, and those dictionaries is basically an array of keys, hashes, and values. So if you put a, a, uh, a value in an object, so we go back to our self.a equals whatever, the object's dictionary conceptually has the value stored under the key a, and they'll be indexed somehow or other. Uh, and then there's, we use a hash table lookup and so on. It, the, uh, there's plenty of other talks on how dictionaries work. Now in 3.10, in 3.3 and onwards, we change this so that the remove the redundant keys and hashes. They're moved into a, a separate data structure which is shared across the class in most cases. And then we have this. So now we just have We've got rid of a lot of the redundancy there. We now have this table of values. The, the keys and hashes are a separate thing. And that's usually accessed from the class where it's sort of cached. And then we have the dictionary that points to those. But you see there's still some in red. So we still have to go, OK, so one other thing is, if we want to access key zero, value zero here, no, we have to follow f this four memory accesses. We need to get the class. We need to get the dictionary offset of the class. We need to use that dictionary offset to find the dictionary pointer in the object. We need to follow that to the dictionary, and then we need to follow that to the table. In 3.3, we use less memory, but we still have the 3.3 3 to 3.10, we still have that number of indirections. We still have to follow all that thing. So the first thing we do in 3.11 is move the pointers. So we can, there's nothing physically stopping us putting pointers in front of like the header of the object. So we move the dictionary pointer in front of that, and that means it's a fixed offset, which means we don't need to look up its offset. So this is the first thing, and we've already reduced the number of uh, indirections to get to our values to two. We haven't saved any memory yet. The second thing we can now observe is that that dictionary is redundant. It has a pointer to a keys, well, we can add the pointer to the, uh, a pointer to value, sorry, but we can add a pointer to the values to the object. It has a header, but it just tells us it's a dictionary. Well, we know it's a dictionary. As a point of the keys, but we can only access the keys via the class. So we can just drop that. And this is what basically a Python object, when you just create it, given the example I, I gave earlier, with just the simple, this very simple thing. Uh, and it will give us this. So this is our nice sort of compact form in 3.11. OK, so that's the data structures. It was a bit of a whirlwind tour, I realize, and it'll get, it won't get slower. Uh, OK, so algorithms. So first of all, bytecode. Bytecode is what the interpreter runs when it's running your Python program. Again, there's plenty of talks on this, but I'll give you a very brief refre refresher or introduction, depending on whether you've seen this stuff before. So take the function on the left. It returns the A attribute of its argument. The bytecode on the right, ignore the resume, that's just sort of an administrative internal thing to just mark the beginning of a function. What it does is it loads the local variable self onto the evaluation stack. It then replaces that with the A attribute of that value, and then it returns the value on top of the stack. In this case, uh, actually, no, I'll just carry on. OK, so this is PEP659. Uh, specialized, the specializing adaptive interpreter. Now, this is kind of the, the headline feature of 3.11. Um, but the reason I did the data structures first is because much of what this does depends on how those data structures are put together and laid out. Uh, as I said earlier, it's, it's the number of memory access that we do is often key performance. And designing our data structures to allow us to do stuff fast is kind of important before we can actually do things fast. So the special divided adaptive interpreter basically has an idea that for each bytecode of, you know, in, of interest, so not simple things like load fast or return value, but the complicated things like looking up an attribute. You know, there's a million different ways you can have an attribute. Well, it's not a million. It's like 13 or something. But different ways of uh, attribute lookups. So you can have properties, methods, values on the attribute, values on the class, uh, and you know, special stuff done in C code and so on and so forth. 
So for each instruction, we basically have in two states. One is the kind of general form, which we call the adaptive form, and that's basically just does the sort of general lookup that we did in 3.10 and decrements a counter. And when that counter reaches zero, we try and specialize it. And we also have the specialized forms, which are customized for you know, particular values or types of values that we see. And those also have a counter from misses. So we don't know that um, every time, you know, just because we've seen integers being added together, we don't know the next time we get to that addition, it's going to be integers. It could be a floating point number. It could be strings. Uh, if we don't see the thing we'd had before, we fall back to the general case and we decrement the counter. This is where it's adaptive because it can it flip flop between these two states. Ideally, it, it basically goes from the adaptive to the specialized state and stays there. But you know, code isn't always that straightforward. So we need to sort of cope reasonably efficiently where the case it isn't. So basically, there's the two forms. There's specialization, where we go from the general to the specialized form, and de-optimization, where we go from the specialized form to the optimized form. So before we get there, there's sort of quickening form. So going back to this sort of bytecode, I'm just going to, that bytecode is the one on the left there, and I've added a few little things. So actually, internally, we have some what's called inline caches, a little bit of space in between some of the bytecodes for putting like data that we kind of need to speed things up. And the quickening form is we change the basically straightforward form, the load attribute, to this load attribute adaptive. And it's basically the same thing. It does the same thing, but it has this counter. So we get to the point where it has this warm-up counter, and the warm-up counter reaches 1. Now, next time we execute, the warm-up counter hits 0, and we specialize. So there's the adaptive form on the left and the specialized form on the right. Now, Assuming we're specializing the function we show for instances of the class we showed earlier, you know, the simple one that just has their A and B attributes. We specialize, and we have this form called load attribute instance value, where there's about 10 different forms of specializations of load attribute. Um, that might be wrong, but it may have been right at some point in the past, or will be right at some point in the future, because we keep changing the number. Um, the load attribute instance value is for this sort of simple case, which is just a normal Python class, nothing special, no properties. They're just the values in the instance. So we have a miss counter, and that says every time we miss, we decrement that, and which gets to zero, we'll just go back to the original form and possibly bounce around a bit. We have a type version, and that basically says we're interested in the current state, whether the current state of the t class of the uh, value we're looking at is it as it was when we specialized the code. So what we do is we add a version number to all classes, and then when we change a class, that gets incremented, and then we can just check the version number as a sort of quick check. And the index here is the, basically the index into the values array. Now, we're not checking the keys here, which is an interesting thing, and this is basically a property of the, uh, the dictionary keys, which I, I omitted to mention earlier, which is that they cannot have keys removed from them. So once we know the key is in the dictionary, the cached dictionary keys on the class, we know that it will always remain in there. If a dictionary, if we delete it from the instance, we can just null out that slot. If we change the class, the instance so much that we have to redo dictionary keys, then we just throw, we don't use the cached form and we have our own thing. Okay. So, I just want to run through how this works quickly. This is unfortunately, this is C code. Um, if you're not seeing C code around, don't worry, I'll just go through this before. So how this works is, so as I said, the object's on the top of the stack, so we pop that off, and then we look in its type, and we check the type version. So that's just the read, the cache. And we have the type version in the cache, we check on the class. If we don't match, we do this, what's called deopt. So we deopt if this thing has, and deopt is basically just, uh, we, uh, I'm just checking the time. So if we deopt, we just uh, increment, decrement the counter, sorry, and then fall back to the sort of general form. If we don't do any deops, we read out the index, and then we're done. Now, we have a few bunch of memory reads here, but these are mostly independent. There's one dependent read in here. So this is much simpler and faster than the sort of more general case. Um, that's not the only specialization we do. We specialize a whole bunch of stuff. There's a whole bunch of, there's the byte codes on the left and the sort of equivalent Python code on the right that we specialize. So 
In summary, we designed the data structures to reduce the memory access. And then we designed specialized bytecodes to, for you know, common cases that we're likely to see. And we designed those to take advantage of those data, new data structures such that you know, we can reduce the cost of a thing. So in other words, we have this data structures plus specialized code equals faster Python. Uh, I'm going to skip the future because uh, you have to come back next year to see what we're doing in 3.12. If you can read really fast, there's some of the things we're going to be doing. And thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. So um, let's see if this works. I just want to say on behalf of the whole team, thank you to all the other core developers who've tolerated us breaking stuff. I particularly want to thank Ken Jin and Nada San and Dennis Sweeney for their contributions. Um, our team is paid, but those are volunteer contributions. So I, I want to thank them for doing that. Yeah, thank you very much again for your presentation. Uh, we have a, a very short time for questions, and we're going to take the remote question first. No, uh, actually, I just hear we're going to take a, f a question from the audience first. Uh, so a quick question. Thanks for your talk. Um, there was this uh, instance of the class and its layout. You have this uh, dunder dict uh, attribute, and it was pointing to null. Do you actually need this pointer at all right now? Uh, well, we could, in theory, tag the values and dictionary and shove them in the same pointer. But we can, I mean, obviously, if someone asks for a dunder dict, yeah, we'll need to fill that in and okay. move the values. And so this is um, basically... Yeah, there was a slide for it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so we go from this, this and then if someone wants the dictionary, we just, whoops, uh, fill it in and put that in. And another question, can, can't you actually inline the values inside the object and reallocate it when someone adds new uh, attributes there? We could do. Uh, that's definitely something we've considered. Um, this is kind of a compromise between flexibility and performance. This, we may add them to the end. The problem is that it's, it's even a, more wasting if we get it wrong with the values, because we can't, they're, they're just there. Yeah. So we have to reassign values, and we still need the pointers, so it's, it's not clear which is better. Okay. Thank Thanks. you very much for the question. Can we have the next question, please? Uh, hi, uh, it's very actually good to hear that there's so many optimizations. I just want, was wondering, with um, so many net tricks in the book now, uh, do you think that we may have some unexpected um, non-determinisms and like uh, pretty much bugs because now the code is not executed in a very deterministic way? Uh, well, it's sort of deterministic, it's just more and more complicated. Um, so we do have fixed counters. I mean, if we had random counters, that's... There are some advantages to randomizing things, but as you say, non-determinism one. But to be honest, it's always been non-deterministic because the hardware is largely. So in terms of performance, in terms of what it does, it should, I mean, yeah, if it's not doing the same thing, it's a bug. Uh, yeah, and it's more complicated, so there are more likely to be bugs. That is definitely a thing. I mean, we're obviously aware of that. We do our best not to introduce more bugs. So there's a, there's a trade-off. Uh, there's a slight risk of introducing new bugs, especially in like obscure cases. Um, and the question is, are we willing to trade that slight risk for significantly increased performance? And I, I believe we are. Well, we, I am. But I believe community as a whole is. Okay, thank you very much for the questions. That's all the time we have now. So let's have another round of applause for Mark. And thank for the talk.